Hello, my name is Richard Klass. I'm your lecturer for strategic thinking, key opinion leader concepts. This presentation is an overview of contributions from several sources that contribute to analysis of industries and potential real world application to strategic initiatives. Insights will come from several academic thought leaders, contributions by consultancies that focus on ways to view industry opportunities for competitive advantage, and real-world applications by the founders of companies that are disruptors of old business practices. My one bias is that academic thought leaders have rarely implemented strategies for a specific company. Their views come from retrospective study of industries and organizations. I think their biggest value is giving a blueprint for identifying industry and company market positions. With this in mind, I'm going to start with the academic thought leader, Henry Mintzberg. One of Professor Mintzberg's premises is that strategies for an organization just happen. It is not usually a planned occurrence. Strategies emerge informally at any level in an organization. In many instances, the most important strategies complement deliberate strategy, which is determined consciously either by top management or with the agreement of top management. Mintzberg is critical of all his peers' writings that focus predominantly on pre-developed strategies. I do not like Mintzberg's position because it means organizations do not effectively plan to capitalize on business opportunities or take decisive steps to mitigate the threats that could cause great harm to the enterprise. Michael Porter is one of the most prolific academic contributors to the discipline of strategic planning. His concept of the five forces shows a company's competitive position relative to external forces. It takes into account the number and power of an enterprise's rivals. In your strategic thinking, how might a competitive landscape change with shifts in the bargaining power of suppliers and the bargaining power of buyers? A good example is the recent demand for personal protection equipment due to the coronavirus outbreak. Clearly, the bargaining power of suppliers is outstripping the bargaining power of buyers due to the current supply and demand imbalance. Obviously, all enterprises should be concerned about new and powerful entrants starting up competitive operations. The threat of substitute products is always a concern, particularly for organizations that have big capital investments in legacy assets. To illustrate, video streaming over the internet is a substitute for renting movies on a disc. You will see Michael Porter's generic strategies portrayed in a four quadrant graphic. I am showing you this graphic, so when you see it in the future, it will not be a new concept. I think it's a bit difficult to understand. So here is a simplified interpretation of Porter's generic strategies. If you're a large company and play in many different product or service arenas, then you're going to compete primarily on cost leadership or differentiation. Cost leadership means you produce a product or service at a much cheaper level than rivals. This allows you to use a low price to capture market share. Competing with a differentiated product means your offerings are distinctive and have the features and benefits customers want. Customers are generally willing to pay a premium price for distinctive offerings. Conversely, if you're a smaller enterprise, the best way to compete is to identify a market segment that is profitable, yet large enough to commit human and capital resources to capture market share. The highly focused strategy requires the identification of the special needs of the market. These needs can be product features or service attributes that are not currently available to consumers. By optimally fulfilling a targeted customer cohort's needs, smaller organizations can outcompete the Goliaths that scatter their resources and focus across many different product and or service offerings. Focus strategies play special attention to the marketing mix. 
that is product features and benefits, pricing levels, promotion opportunities, and channel of distribution options. A relatively new academic insight emanates from the work of Professors Kim and Morbone. They split industries into two categories. The first category they term as red ocean. Companies that compete in a red ocean face fierce competition. Strategic initiatives focus on beating rivals. In this environment, you either win or you lose, so it's a zero-sum game. The second category is termed blue ocean. Industries in this category stake out a new market space. Strategic initiatives make competition irrelevant, meaning a company has no rivals and has no threat of substitute products taking market share. Strategic initiatives focus on creating value through innovation. Examples of companies swimming in a blue ocean is Cirque du Soleil, Amazon, Cordis, a Johnson Johnson division that controlled the coronary stent business, and NetJets. The real world applicability of finding a blue ocean opportunity is difficult. So I think this theory for most business enterprises is not implementable. I spoke at length about the life cycle concept in video two of this lecture series. So I'm not going to go over it again. However, I want to point out that the idea of blue ocean versus red ocean could be superimposed upon the life cycle curve. Eventually, competition will find a way of turning a blue ocean red, sending a product into a maturity and eventually decline phase of the life cycle. E. Edward Deming's theory on quality was implemented by Japanese automakers. At one time, automobiles were not thought of as assets that would last for a long time. Many autos were not overly reliable. Built-in obsolescence was the norm. Japanese automakers were at the bottom of the quality list. You can see in this graphic the impact of a quality improvement program implemented by the Japanese automakers. It took their market share from 9% in 1975 to 40% by 2005. Eventually, of course, other car manufacturers were forced to compete on quality. I urge you to read Deming's writings on management. His teachings are the foundation for many good business practices. I could categorize Deming as both an academic and a consultant. So his accomplishments are a good segue into the next category of thought leaders. You may recall in video two of this lecture series, I spoke about some of the Boston Consulting Group's applications to the field of strategic planning. So I will not speak to their concepts in this video. One consultant worthy of note, particularly to the healthcare industry, is Quentin Studer. The Studer Group's clients include many hospitals and healthcare related not-for-profits. So I would not be surprised if those of you in this industry come across a Studer plan or Studer influence documents. Studer's system is to develop strategies around six core areas, service, quality, financial or revenue generation, human resources, growth, and community. For me, the Studer system has a major flaw. Notably, his six pillars are worthy of focus for developing objectives. However, since strategies should be based upon external opportunities and threats, the six pillars are not good guides for initiatives to win in the marketplace. I admit I am not a thought leader. My story, however, will help you understand the importance of defining a business in a way that maximizes stakeholder value. My family's business was Blizzard Fan and Blower Company. Our focus was on products for industrial use. One of our products was an air curtain that kept flying insects out of warehouses. There came a time when I had to make a choice of either operating the family business myself or selling the enterprise. I chose to sell the company. I did not recognize the opportunities in front of me. Had I rethought the business I was in, I would have made a different decision. First, I missed the big move in homeowners purchasing paddle fans. 
but even in the industrial segment, I could have turned the larger air curtain into a hand drying apparatus. I would have been first to market many years ahead of Dyson who has hand drying apparatuses in nearly every bathroom across America and maybe even the world. Dyson generates almost six billion dollars a year in revenues and has a market cap of almost one trillion dollars. They define their business as anything moving air. What we can learn from Dyson is that through great engineering, you can take products in the declining phase of their life cycle and turn them into innovative products that consumers value. I now want to talk to you about the business leaders that have contributed to strategic thought. eBay shows us the value of the network effect. This is an easy rationale to understand. The more buyers you have participating in a network, the more value the network becomes to sellers. Symbiotically, the more sellers you have with a broad array of offerings, the more value buyers will place on becoming part of the network. Sam Walton started Walmart. He showed the value of several strategic moves. First, go where there is weak competition. Smaller mom and pop retail outlets could not compete with Walmart on price of products, depth of product offerings, and the convenience of one-stop shopping. Further, most rural communities could not support more than one big box store. So for Walmart, first mover advantage became significant. Larry Page and Sergey Brin founded Google. For many years, Google did not generate a profit. But Page and Brin knew in the long run that by dominating the search engine space and capturing the search history of users, they created a value to advertisers. Rather than a shotgun approach to targeting potential buyers, Google could help advertisers target consumers with an immediate purchase intention. Facebook helps advertisers target buyers in a different way. They take the approach of knowing their users by specific demographic, psychographic, and interest profiles. One takeaway as a difference between these companies is that Google has virtually no limits to who uses their search engine. Facebook, on the other hand, is limited to those people that are signed up for the application. In this slide, you can see the dramatic change in allocation of advertising dollars by media option that has taken place in recent years. Google and Facebook have a large share of this growth. The internet is the only media option that has grown by more than double digits year over year. TV is the second most utilized media option, but related advertising expenditures are flat. I do not want to leave the not-for-profits out of the strategy discussion. The American Association of Retired People was originally founded in 1947. Today, it is the premier organization representing elder Americans. While most not-for-profits struggle for unrestricted grants, AARP is awash in money. They understood the value of their brand. They gave the rights to United Healthcare to brand their managed care program under the AARP banner. In exchange, they receive almost $1 billion a year in revenues. Another not-for-profit shows us the value of partnerships. Not-for-profits fill the vacuum where governments cannot fill the need for essential social services. They also offer companies the opportunity to have an honest and reliable partner for supporting community charitable giving. The United Way has a first mover, an unshakable advantage in partnering with corporations. Overall, the United Way raises almost $4 billion a year. The vast majority of these funds come from employees of larger companies. Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings of Netflix 
teach us business enterprises should cannibalize themselves before someone else takes you out of business. Blockbuster learned too late using brick and mortar stores to disseminate videos was not a sustainable business model. By contrast, Netflix was a nimble company. It moved its business model from mailing content to consumers to video streaming. Wall Street did not recognize the value in Netflix's strategic moves and criticized the revenue loss they were going to incur. What we now know was just a short-term hiccup. Blockbuster taught us not to get caught up in legacy resources. Blockbuster had the opportunity of purchasing Netflix for about $50 million. But of course, it got caught up in the thinking that they were a brick and mortar retailer. Today, Netflix has about $170 billion market cap and Blockbuster is out of business. The last of the entrepreneurs I want to expose you to are James Frederick Smith that developed Federal Express and Wade Heisinga, Dean Buntrock, and Barry Beck that started Waste Management. These entrepreneurs showed us the opportunity in filling government service gaps. FedEx filled the gap for people that needed absolutely positively overnight delivery of important documents. Waste management filled the gap for garbage removal where municipalities found it cheaper to contract the service to a private entity rather than develop a government controlled entity. Today, the market cap for Federal Express is $33 billion and waste management, it is $42 billion. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. For those of you that are interested in continuing to develop your knowledge of strategic planning, I suggest you read two books, Harvard Business Review's 10 Must Reads on Strategy and Professor Kim's and More Bones' Blue Ocean Shift. For those of you that are analytically inclined, you should get a copy of the book, Segmentation and Positioning for Strategic Marketing Decisions by James Myers. I recently picked up a copy for a friend on eBay for under $5.